The Toronto Young Rangers were a Junior A level hockey team based out of Toronto, Ontario from the 1937-38 season through until 1948. While they were never a top level team in their league, they were fortunate enough to be involved in the hockey development of a variety of different future NHL stars, including Albert Dewsbury, Red Hamill, Murray Henderson, George Parsons, Gordy Drillon, and Punch Imlach. At the time, most teams at this level held affiliation agreements with NHL squads. This was before the NHL amateur and entry draft existed, so teams in the NHL had to set up scouting networks through affiliations. Teams would create a network of affiliations throughout Canada and the northern United States. Of course, they would play other teams who had their own affiliations, so it was important that if you saw a player that you were interested in, you as a manager needed to extend the offer of a player contract form to that player. The owner and coach of the Young Rangers was a man by the name of Ed Wildy. Wildy was a sportsman, essentially a sports and entertainment focused business person who had made an arrangement with the owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs to practice his team at the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. In the team's second season, Wildy would discover two talented brothers from North York. Oswald Carnegie was the oldest brother and often went by the name Ozzy. He was a good skater with the ability to rush around players and make slick passes. He was a year older than his brother and played on the wing. He was an excellent hockey player in his own right. He was surpassed, however, by his younger brother Herbert, simply known as Herb. Herb and Ozzy stood out in the ice. They had grown up playing hockey together and had the ability to play together in a way that only brothers could. They dominated possession, scored tons of goals, and their line consistently collected points in large numbers. Ozzy was a great compliment to his brother, and Herb often won his battles on the faceoff as a centerman. Herb joined the Young Rangers after three successful years of high school hockey, even though it meant dropping out of school to do so. The Young Rangers would practice from 5am until 7am at Maple Leaf Gardens. Looking back, he acknowledges that he likely would not have been able to do so well at school with those hours. Even still, one of the people who supported him to get to the gardens was one of his high school teachers. The way Herb saw it, there were another six or seven years to pursue his father's wish of him becoming a doctor, but he figured he could be a pro hockey player within two years. Coach Wildy would have each player take a puck and puck handle through legs of chairs like they were opponents. He preached looking before passing, never giving the puck away, and a puck possession style of hockey. Herb began to experience major success, including a five goal outburst against the North Bay Trappers, leading the local newspaper to announced that it was one of the most brilliant displays ever seen. One day at practice, Wildy called over 19 year old Herb to talk and point out a man sitting in the blue seats at the gardens. You see that man sitting there? That's Con Smythe. Con Smythe was the owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs and had given Wildy the ability to practice with his team at the Maple Leaf Gardens. He had told Wildy that he would love to have Carnegie on his team and would sign him to play for the Maple Leafs, Carnegie's childhood team, immediately if he could, but he was unable to because Herb and Ozzy Carnegie were black. Years later, Smythe instead, in jest or in seriousness, offered to pay anyone $10,000 if they could make Carnegie white. It wasn't only his high level of skill and chemistry with his brother that made him stand out as a player on the ice. Herb was a black man. Born to Jamaican immigrants, Herb was pursuing a place in a sport dominated by white hockey males and would find himself fighting to break a color barrier in a sport that is possibly the most staunchly traditionalist. Carnegie would go on to have a brilliant hockey career and establish himself as one of the most productive hockey players in the semi-professional and amateur levels of hockey in Canada. Yet he never played a game in the NHL. Hi. I'm Travis Duncan, and I'm a middle class white dude, and even I'm sick of this crap. And this is Storytime Hockey. <laughs> Herb Carnegie was born on November 8, 1919, the fifth of seven children, to George and Adina Carnegie. George had gotten a job working for Toronto Hydro when he arrived in North York. Herb, much like many other young Canadians at the time, took up skating when he was four and it was not long before he added a hockey stick. Carnegie had older siblings, so he quickly joined them on the rink. One day, his sister Bernice commented that he was really good. From there, he believed that he would in fact make the NHL. Despite being a skilled hockey player, the color of his skin would be a major barrier so socially for Carnegie. In elementary school, he was banned by the school principal from showing up early because his other classmates would yell racial epithets at him. Carnegie would retaliate and a fight would break out. Carnegie continued playing hockey and began discussing his desire to try out for the high school hockey team. His father warned him that the other boys would not want to travel with him to games. This did not stop Carnegie as he would play for his high school team for three years. Fans of the high school game would yell, get that black bastard, among the other taunts and name calling. Carnegie later shared that he used his abilities as a hockey player to silence them. 
He then made the jump to the Junior A level, the highest development level in Canada at the time, with the Young Rangers, where he recorded 10 goals and 6 assists in 13 games. His next stop was the semi-professional mining leagues of Northern Ontario. At this point in time, Canada was rapidly expanding their natural resource sector. Young men would leave large metropolitan cities to work in mines and forestry, and in doing so would need to find a way to fill their time. One of the most popular methods was either playing for or participating as a fan in the mining hockey leagues. Companies would actually pursue players for their hockey skill and offer them jobs in exchange for their skills on the team. Carnegie would move to Timmins, where he would join the Buffalo Anchorites hockey team. The Buffalo Anchorite mine is located southeast of modern day Timmins. At the time that Carnegie moved north, it was being mined for gold, pyrite, and tourmaline. There are various sources that claim that Carnegie played in Buffalo, New York for a team called the Anchorites, and that's a huge error in geographic knowledge. Carnegie played on a line with his brother, Ozzy, and a man named Manny McIntyre. Together, they made up what is widely considered the first Afro-Canadian starting hockey line outside of a color-specific hockey league, such as the Colored Hockey League in Nova Scotia. Even in the praise they received from the hockey community, racism continued to undercut their accomplishments. They were nicknamed the Colored Section, the Brown Bombers, the Dusky Speedsters, the Dark Destroyers, or the Black Aces. Even as they continued to face active racism from their surrounding community, they dominated the league. One game in particular, the line single-handedly defeated the Hollinger Green Shirts 15 to 4. They would go on to face the Sioux Greyhounds for the Northern Ontario Senior League Championship that year, winning by a final score of 12 to 1. It was clear in a strictly hockey sense these three players, led by Herb Carnegie, were beyond the talent level afforded to them in the Northern Amateur Leagues. They were so good in fact that they were a draw to come and see them specifically at the hockey games. Here we are faced with another example of racism by those who supported them. To the owners of the mining teams, a colored line was a gate draw. It was a novelty. People would come to see the hockey players players, but would also come to see the novelty of an all-black hockey playing line. At the same time, the importance of a all-black line began to leave its mark, and not just on the regular hockey aficionados, but also the future of the sport. Future Toronto Maple Leaf great and Hockey Hall of Famer Frank Mahovlich grew up in Timmins watching the mining league teams play. As a young consumer of hockey, he began to learn the nuances of the game from watching his local heroes. This is truly one of the most important points to recognize in this entire discussion surrounding racism in the sport of hockey. Mahovlich shared in 2012 that he grew up watching hockey that included a line of three black players. In his head as a child, that was just part of hockey. And despite what was happening around him, if he was going to play hockey in the future, he was going to need to play against black hockey players. That was the end of the discussion as far as he was concerned, and the head of a young impressionable hockey child, hockey included black players. After demonstrating that he was well above the abilities of that league, Carnegie moved to the Quebec Provincial Senior League. This league included southern Quebec cities and towns with teams that competed at the top level outside of a fully professional rank. The Quebec League was widely considered the final step before professional and the NHL, despite the ongoing development of a feeder system that included the United States Hockey League and the American Hockey League. His first year in the league, he played with the Shawinigan Falls Cataracts and announced his presence in the league instantly. He recorded 54 points with 24 goals and 30 assists in only 33 games. This first year he was in the league was 1944 and 1945. This is around the time that players of color were starting to be acknowledged for their abilities as sportsmen and athletes. The color barrier was, and is, a figurative wall between people of color and the top position in their sport. With this barrier, players with inferior abilities as an athlete were able to advance to the top league of their sport, while superior players were held back based on the color of their skin. Not only did this deprive those players of a position in the best league in the world, the reward for their dedication to the sport and making themselves the best athletes they could, but it also denied them the ability to maximize their financial earning potential. It is no secret that the best leagues in the world pay the best salaries. Modern day soccer players do not travel to England, France and Spain for minimal salaries or for the ability to play soccer somewhere that is nice. They do it because the best leagues attract the best players because they provide the highest financial incentive. At this time though, the color barrier was starting to be breached. That isn't to say that it was eliminated, as many of the professional sports in North America had a first colored player make their way into the league, only to be followed by a stretch of time without them again. In 1946, Kenny Washington and Willie Strode broke the color barrier with the LA Rams of the National Football League. In 1947, after featuring with the Montreal Royals, Jackie Robinson broke through with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Hockey was primed for a colored player to join their professional ranks, and Carnegie was clearly quite good enough. 
In 1945-46, Carnegie moved to the Sherbrooke Randies and continued his impressive pace, recording 45 goals and 30 assists in 40 games. Once again, because it's ridiculous, I feel that it needs to be pointed out that he recorded 45 goals in 40 games. It was in Sherbrooke that Carnegie would have his line reunited with brother Ozzy and fellow black player Manny McIntyre. In this first year with Sherbrooke, Herb would win the title for the most valuable player. Carnegie began to draw fans to the rinks, but again it was twofold. Part of this was because of his abilities as a hockey player, but the fact that he was black and playing on a black line also made people want to come and see them. Herb was the centerman of the line, with Ozzy lined up on his right and McIntyre on his left. The following year, Herb would continue his assault on the league with 33 goals and 50 assists for 83 points in 50 games, and the Randys would change their name to the Sherbrooke St. Francois. Herb was continuing to find personal success and beginning as well to influence the way the game was played. He earned the nickname Swivel Hips at one point thanks to the way that he could move his hips as he deked around players and used powerful skating abilities to go around them. Herb influenced young hockey fans in Sherbrooke and the rest of Quebec much in the same way he had with Mahovlich in Timmins. Jean Beliveau wrote that Herbie, as he called him, was a can't miss. At the age of 13 and 14, Beliveau would never miss a game when Sherbrooke traveled to Victoriaville. He openly admitted trying to duplicate Carnegie's face-offs and passing traits, focusing on making a pass to the blade of the stick and not behind the player. And this is likely a functional remnant of the coaching advice given to Carnegie during his young Rangers days with Ed Wildey. In the 1947 and 1948 year, Carnegie's story took a major turn. On his way to another MVP title, Carnegie played 63 games with Sherbrooke and recorded 48 goals, 79 assists for an astonishing 127 points. It was no longer possible to ignore the talent that Carnegie had as a player, and at the age of 28, he was at his peak as a player, placing astonishing numbers in the highest Canadian league outside of the professional ranks. It was time for him to receive an opportunity to play in the NHL. That is exactly what the New York Rangers thought they would do. They called him to attend their training camp on September 18, 1948. The training camp was held in Saranac Lake, New York, about two and a half hours north of Albany and an hour and a half from the Canadian border. To attend training camp, Carnegie would need to visit an embassy and to take both the letter that invited him to training camp with his birth certificate to receive a 29-day working pass to enter the United States. He was also reminded to bring his own skates and to make sure that they were sharpened so he would not lose any time waiting for his skates to be sharpened instead of being on the ice. Carnegie attended camp and fared well enough to be offered a contract. The Rangers had an affiliate team in Tacoma, Washington, and they offered him $2,700 to play. Not only would that require Carnegie to move to the far side of the continent, some 4,600 miles away, but it would also be a steep cut to his earnings. After turning that offer down, Frank Boucher, the coach and manager of the Rangers, offered Carnegie a contract with their affiliate team in St. Paul, Minnesota with the United States Hockey League, a step up from their team in Tacoma. They offered him $4,700 to participate with their affiliate in St. Paul. Carnegie did not see the value to going to St. Paul, again a massive travel request, while at the same time taking another pay cut, so he turned down their offer. The final offer came from the Rangers for him to join their American Hockey League franchise, the New Haven Ramblers in New Haven, Connecticut. They asked him to participate at the AHL level, and if he performed, they would call him up when injuries occurred. The AHL was certainly a step in the right direction when it comes to competitive hockey, but it was only paying him $4,700 compared to the $5,100 he earned with Sherbrooke. The $4,700 at the American League level was a price still set under his skill set, far from the value of NHL contracts being signed and those of his AHL counterparts. At the age of 28, with three children and a fourth on the way, Carnegie had to make the choice to stay in Sherbrooke. The team tried to convince him to stay. Remind him that if he did sign the contract, he would make international headlines, to which he retorted, my family can't eat headlines. Red Story, the Hockey Hall of Fame referee, spoke about Carnegie and his line from Quebec. He said that they were all three good enough to play in the American Hockey League, but Herbie was the leader. They couldn't have gone anywhere without Herb. He was good enough to play at the NHL, and it was strictly a color, not talent, issue that kept him out. When we talk about systematic racism versus situational racism, it is clear here that Carnegie was a victim of this racism in a systematic sense. There was no doubting that Carnegie was an NHL-level hockey talent. His 
points totals and abilities to raise the effectiveness of his teammates prove that. But he had to wait until he was 28 to be offered a chance to participate at a training camp, let alone participate in an NHL game. For years, Carnegie had been confined to the semi-professional hockey leagues due to the color of his skin. And finally, when given a chance to break into the NHL, he was presented with an opportunity designed over a long period of time for him to turn away from. If any more proof is needed that he was held back because of his race, just prior to the 1948 season, four New York Rangers players were involved in a car accident that led them to being injured. Buddy O'Connor was out for six weeks with broken ribs, and Edgar Laprade was out for an undetermined amount of time after struggling to recover from a concussion. Carnegie was still available, but would not be offered a spot to fill in on the Rangers. Carnegie himself explained that if the Rangers really wanted him, they would have reached out, but they never did. That was as close as Carnegie would ever come to the NHL, and as close as a black player would come to playing in the league until Willie O'Ree broke through with the Boston Bruins in 1958. Let's not forget that O'Ree only played two games in 1957-1958 with the Boston Bruins, and would not see the NHL again until 1960-1961. Carnegie would return to Sherbrooke for one final year, and record 71 points in 63 games before moving to the Quebec Aces, where he played with and mentored the next Quebec-born phenom, Jean Beliveau. Beliveau made no secret that Carnegie belonged in the NHL and praised his skills and abilities, even writing the foreword to Carnegie's biography, where he outlined that the players learned from Carnegie both on and off the ice. Carnegie would play four years with the Aces, and his production remained respectable, but his dominant days were behind him. He recorded three seasons above 50 points, and in his final year with the Aces, he recorded 29 points in 52 games. In his final year of hockey in 1953, he moved to the Ontario Hockey Association Senior League with the Owen Sound Mercuries, recording 55 points in 54 games. Unfortunately for Carnegie, he was never able to accomplish his dream of reaching the NHL or achieving his full financial earning potential from hockey. In 1964, he joined the Investors Group as a financial advisor, becoming the first black Canadian advisor in the company. He worked for the company successfully for 32 years, eventually being inducted into the Investors Group Hall of Fame. He continued to stay active and competitive, joining senior golf tournaments. As a child, he had hitchhiked to Thornhill Golf Club to both learn the game of golf and earn money as a caddy. In high school, he had won multiple golf championships, and he continued winning after retiring from hockey. And in 1977-1978, he won the Canadian Men's Senior Amateur Championship. In 1968, he patented the Carnegie System, a system of magnetic instructional boards that would be used for decades to provide instructional opportunities to coaches and players in hockey, as well as other sports. Carnegie, even though he had been held back from the highest level of hockey, held the sport with a special reverence. He said, Hockey has treated me very well in the past, and now I want to do something for the betterment of the game. Perhaps his longest lasting legacy will be the future Aces. In 1955, he founded the Future Aces Hockey School in North York. It was the first registered hockey school in Canada. Carnegie said, from my point of view, I was excluded from hockey. I wanted something inclusive. And the idea came to me, if we have the fundamentals of the game of hockey, why can't we have the fundamentals of how to live and what are they? Carnegie developed the organization around 12 points to living and hockey that he felt were integral, now known as the Future Aces Creed. The creed focuses on attitude, hard work, courage, cooperation, empathy, education, service, and sportsmanship. In 1987, Carnegie expanded the Future Aces with his wife Audrey and his daughter Bernice to establish the Herbert H. Carnegie Future Aces Foundation to inspire and assist youth and adults to become the best they can be as responsible and caring citizens in their community. Following this, Herb began to slow down but did not fade away from achieving even more accomplishments. In 1996, with the help from his daughter, he released a biography, A Fly in a Pail of Milk, The Herb Carnegie Story. The foreword was written by Jean Beliveau. In 1996, he was awarded the Order of Ontario, and in 2003, the Order of Canada, the highest civilian honor in Canada. He had an arena and an elementary school named after him in North York and York Region, and received an honorary doctorate of laws from York University. All of this was on top of a Queen Silver Jubilee Medal in 1977, the Ontario Medal for Good Citizenship in 1988, and the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal in 2002. As Carnegie got older, he lost his sight and he passed away on March 9th, 2012 at the age of 92.
Today, Carnegie's name is listed in 13 different Halls of Fame, including Canada's Sports Hall of Fame and the Ontario Sports Hall of Fame. However, he remains out of the Hockey Hall of Fame. While he was still alive, there was a push made to get him into the Hall of Fame, led by Toronto Star columnist Jim Proudfoot. Unfortunately, Proudfoot suffered a stroke that kept him from arguing Carnegie's merits, and he passed away in 2001. Red Story and Brian Conacher later picked up the efforts to try and get his name selected, but were unsuccessful. The Hockey Hall of Fame has recently, likely thanks to the influence of social media, had to become more conscientious of both who is on the selection committee as well as who they elect into the Hall of Fame. The ability to select players without explanation no longer exists. Grant Fuhrer was the first black hockey player elected to the Hall of Fame in 2003. Angela James became the second as well as one of the first two women and the first openly gay member of the Hockey Hall of Fame. They will likely be joined by a third black player named to the Hockey Hall of Fame depending on when the selection committee selects the new inductees for this year, as any exclusion of Jerome McGinley to hockey's highest honor would be nothing except an affront to hockey. Today, the NHL enjoys the talents of multiple black players, but still continues to deal with racism within its sport. Akeem Aliyu has spoken openly about his experiences with Brad Peters and Steve Downey. Brandon Manning's actions towards Boko and Mama earned him a five-game suspension and a loss in the fight at their next meeting, and possibly a lost contract extension. Evander Kane, Wayne Simmons, pierre Edward Belmare, and others continue to raise the profile of black hockey players. At the same time, we look to hockey players who trace their heritage to other minorities, including Nazim Kadri, Matt Nieto, Max Pacioretty, Kair Yamamoto, Alec Martinez, Brandon Saad, Austin Matthews, Carey Price, Ethan Bear, Kyle Okoposo, Jujar Karia, and others. All of these players have found themselves at the forefront of a sport while at the same time only have the ability to do so thanks to the sacrifice and systematic racism experienced by players like Herb Carnegie. Some have had to deal with more high-profile incidents of racism than others. Moments like Wayne Simmons' shootout in London, Ontario during an NHL exhibition game have gained most media attention. Hockey should be for everyone. Your spot on a team should be determined by your skills on the ice. Today, for the most part, players have the ability to say that they can achieve that. Despite this, players are frequently targeted with racial slurs and attacks at minor hockey levels. It is clear that there continues to be targeted racism in hockey and it needs to stop. One way of signaling this would be to reach out to the Hockey Hall of Fame selection committee members to encourage them to include Herb Carnegie on the next ballot. The following names are of the selection committee members who are active on social media It would make a great starting point in a grassroots movement to include Carnegie on the next ballot. Brian Burke, Cassie Campbell-Pascal, Mark Defoy, Michael Farber, Pierre Maguire, Bob McKenzie. next section will focus on players that you may or may not have forgotten about. With no real rhyme or reason to the selection of these players, this portion of the podcast will be dedicated to the players that score occasionally, get traded for a second round pick, and sometimes even win an award. This is Storytime Hockey, the players you forgot about. Just because black players were beginning to be introduced to the highest level of hockey, it doesn't mean that the world magically changed overnight. There continued to be a pervasive racism issue in the sport beyond the experiences of Herb Carnegie and Willie O'Ree. No better exemplified than the experiences of Tony McKegney. First, it is only appropriate to discuss Tony's early life as he makes no secrets about it. Lowry McKegney was a member of the Royal Canadian Air Force and had often been stationed in areas where he frequently saw orphaned children. This weighed on him until he and his family were able to settle in Sarnia, Ontario, and they moved to adopt. When Tony was 18 months old, the McKegney family adopted him from his birth parents in Montreal, Quebec. His birth parents were a Nigerian immigrant to Canada and a Quebecois mother. McKegney's adoptive family was white and had three children of their own and then adopted three others, Tony being the second. McKegney recalls that sitting on his adoptive mother's knee, he would look outside the window and see a hockey rink that his father Lowry was building. He remembers being mesmerized by the rink and the floodlights, and being excited to be old enough to join the people on the rink. When he was old enough, he quickly took to the sport 
though it was clear that he was just simply a natural athlete. He was a star baseball pitcher as well, but it was hockey that really held his passion. He grew up playing on that rink, even playing with neighborhood friends including neighbor Dino Cicerelli. He does not recall facing too much in the way of racist taunting as a child, though he does recall when his mother would take him to Detroit Tigers and Red Wings games, people would react to seeing a black child with a white mother. In Sarnia, however, and in his neighborhood, he felt that the abilities of his family as athletes earned them a certain level of respect from their peers. McKegney would go on to play for the Sarnia Blackhawks and the Sarnia Bees before breaking through with the Kingston Canadians of the OMJHL, the precursor to the Ontario Hockey League. McKegney fared well in Kingston. He put up 75 points in his rookie year over 52 games. The next season, he followed up with 80 points in 65 games and then had his major breakout year with 58 goals, 77 assists for 135 points in 66 games. He would play one more year in junior where he would record 92 points in 55 games and would play with Team Canada at the World Junior Hockey Championships, recording 8 points in 6 games, winning bronze while on a line with Wayne Gretzky. That year was good enough to turn the heads of the National Hockey League and World Hockey Association franchises who would be selecting players to fill out their rosters. The Birmingham Bulls of the WHA were intent on getting McKegney to sign with their franchise. The Bulls were a perennially fringe club in the league, never finding any real sustained success. Owner John Bassett had originally had the franchise playing as the Toronto Toros but was attempting to build hockey in an unconventional market. They managed to recruit a variety of talented hockey players, but many were past their prime or simply only had a big name. Paul Henderson, Frank Mahovlic, and Gilles Grattan were all part of the Bulls teams. At the same time, the franchise and the league were starting to crack under the competitive pressure from the National Hockey League. Rumors were spreading that the league itself was considering merging with the NHL, and players were experiencing a different level of individual freedom with the WHA of franchises finding more time to enjoy the perks of being a high-paid athlete than before. Bassett held no interest in trying to fight the good fight. He was intent on making as minimal a payment as he could to keep the squad afloat and folding the franchise when it became clear that the WHA model was no longer sustainable. He began to sign young junior stars who he could pay less. One example of this was teenage Ken Linsman, who was younger than the WHA's minimum 20-year-old player. Bassett was able to fight the league in court and win the right to keep Linsman on the team. He signed players like Pat Reagan, Keith Crowder, Michel Goulet, Rick Vave, and Rob Bramage on the now fan-named Baby Bulls. McKegney was another name that he targeted. Bassett had pursued the entire starting line of the Canada Under-20 squad of Gretzky, McKegney, and Wayne Babich. Babich would move to the NHL and Gretzky to the Indianapolis Racers, but McKegney would sign the Bulls. Even though he would not be playing with his line mates, McKegney could finally realize a dream of playing professional hockey. The problem was, in late 1970s, Birmingham was a tense place to be. The city itself had gained some notoriety for the civil rights protests spanning the previous 20 years. A series of bombings, fires, riots, protests, and attacks were eventually succeeded by Martin Luther King Jr., a march on Washington, and the Civil Rights Address. This essentially ended the formal segregation in the state, but informal segregation would exist as many of the people living in Alabama continued to struggle with reconciling their upbringings and feelings towards people of color with social change. Lots of white people saw this as the fact that they had lost something, instead of seeing that the community as a whole had gained something. When McKegney signed his first deal, paying him $50,000 for that year, with the intent on discussing an extension, McKegney thought this was it. However, the story goes on that one of the owner's associates ran into Bassett's office to express some significant concerns that their young new signing was black. Bassett had owned professional sports teams in the past, with the World Football League's Memphis Southmen and the Canadian Football League's Toronto Argos. Both teams had employed black players. When the news that he had signed McKegney leaked to the press, fans began to call to the team's office and pressure Bassett. Everybody had heard of Tony McKegney, everybody had saw McKegney's stat lines. No one had seen a picture of McKegney. Business associates and supporters began to cancel tickets and deals with the team. General Manager Jill Leger recalls hearing Bassett yell on the phone with people who would call and target Bassett with their anger. With the franchise already facing tight financial restraints and money quickly leaving the building, Bassett needed to find a way out of this. At the same time, 
Fans eventually found the phone number for the McKegney household in Sarnia and began calling the family saying that they were from the Ku Klux Klan and beginning to threaten them. Bassett as well began to receive threats and considering that there had been over 50 dynamite attacks against the black residents in that city during the civil unrest, intimidation was a real thing and a real factor that Bassett had to deal with. Bassett cancelled the deal saying that the team could not afford his salary and news outlets falsely claimed that McKegney had requested more money than ever other entry level players. McKegney, fortunately enough, was old enough to be selected in the NHL draft. Ranked much higher, the uncertainty of his situation and possibility of him playing in the WHA led to him falling to 32nd overall in the draft to the Buffalo Sabres. Fortunately, McKegney went on to have a long, entertaining NHL career. He played half a season with the Hershey Bears in the AHL and then played five seasons with the Buffalo Sabres. He was traded on June 8, 1983 to the Quebec Nordiques where he would play a season and a half and and found himself in the right place at the right time on April 20th, 1984 for the Good Friday Massacre game versus the Montreal Canadiens. He would be traded again to the Minnesota North Stars where he played two and a half years before being moved to the New York Rangers. He was then moved to the St. Louis Blues where in 1987-1988 he became the first black player to record 40 goals in a season, earning himself a place at the All-Star game though he missed it due to injuries. He was moved again with Bernie Federico from the Blues to the Red Wings in exchange for Adam Oates and Paul McLean, a deal that paid dividends for years for the Blues but is widely regarded as one of the worst trades for the Red Wings. Federico only played one year with the squad and McKegney experienced personality conflicts with teammates and was returned to Quebec 14 games into that year. McKegney finished his NHL career with 912 games played, 320 goals, 319 assists for 639 points. McKegney would go on to play one year in Italy with Farise and compete in the Spengler Cup with Team Canada. He would play one final season with the San Diego Gulls of the International Hockey League. Most importantly, he paved the way for other athletes that represent minorities to see someone like them play in the NHL, a feat that McKegney did not have when he was there. Fortunately for him, he did find a home with the Sabres when he broke into the league. The Sabres group of players spent their free time with the Buffalo Bills NFL squad, a tradition that continues in many ways today. So there were black athletes that the players hung out with, so for him, being there was a normal and normalized thing. In 20 years of playing hockey up to that point with the Sabres, he had never played against an Another black athlete, and it would be another three years until Grant Fuhrer broke into the league with the Edmonton Oilers. Since then, the league has been blessed with a collection of hockey players that fit every role. Ryan Reeves is the current heavyweight champion fighter in the league. Matt Dumba has taken the helm of the most traded player while never being traded. Evander Kane and Seth Jones are likely the two names at the top of the best player of color competition. Without these players, the NHL and hockey would be a far worse experience for us as fans and for players as a whole. Much of their success success is owed to the names we discussed today in Herb Carnegie and Tony McKegney. Storytime Hockey is written and produced by me, Travis Duncan, and I'll say his name, his name is George Floyd. Thank you for listening. Please click like, subscribe, or whatever other option your podcast device gives you. If you have the option to rate and review, please do. Follow us on Twitter at Storytime Hockey. Every interaction we have with you increases the chance that we will appear in your friend's suggested podcast list. So be a good neighbor and hit five stars. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you again next episode.